Today, Psalm 116, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death encompassed me and pangs of shale laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tear and my tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I spoke. I'm greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. For what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation, call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This is one of those psalms as we read it that is beautiful because it's a psalm of thankfulness. And what we see in Psalm 116 is a person in trouble, a person who is in trouble and yet calls out to the Lord and rejoices because God hears their cry. This psalm reveals to us a God of grace, a God who delivers us in our time of trouble, a God who delivers us in our time of fear. This is one of the psalms that are referred to as the halal psalms. The word halal means praise. So it's a song of thanksgiving and praise. And this is a psalm that was sung during the time of the festivals like the Passover or Pentecost, Tabernacles or the Feast of Dedication. This is a psalm that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, the day before he was crucified, this is a psalm that Jesus would have recited or sung with his men. And knowing, uh, knowing this, that Jesus actually sung this psalm that night, we have a deeper look into the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ because when we look at verse 1, notice how he says, I love the Lord. He heard my voice and my supplications. He inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Now, when it says here, I love the Lord, the thought of loving the Lord is unique. It's a unique concept to many people because people don't really realize that you can actually love the Lord because many religions worship an angry, vengeful, distant, and impersonal God. For them, the concept of a, a, a loving God is totally foreign. The thought that there's a God who loves them, that they can actually have a relationship with, is a foreign attitude. It's the same kind of attitude that many people have today, though. When you speak concerning your relationship to God, when you say, I know the Lord, I have fellowship with Him, I, I have a relationship with Him, then humorists and comedians make fun of you. They say, oh, you've got a relationship with God. You guys double date, and they make fun of your relationship with God. When you say that you speak to the Lord, and that you actually know that He hears your prayer, they think that you're foolish. They don't believe that. If there is a God in their concept whatsoever, very often it's not a loving God. It may be an angry God. It may be a vengeful God. It could be a petty God, an all-powerful, but without any compassionate kind of God. But the psalmist says, I love the Lord. I have a relationship with Him. It's beyond religion. It's not something that we, that we theorize. It's not some kind of theological uh, concept, a philosophy of some sort that I, that I cling to, you know, a, kind of an ethic or moral code. I love the Lord is what he's saying. I have a relationship with God. I know the Lord, and I love Him. The question has to be asked, can we, the church, can every person in this room tonight who's gathered to hear a Bible study, can every one of us say with a passion that we love the Lord? Can we honestly and openly say, you know what, I do love Jesus Christ? Not just to somebody who's seated next to us here in the church service. It's easy to do that when you're gathered together with people of like mind that make it very easy to say, oh, yes, I love the Lord. 
But do we have the ability to say that no matter what, no matter what the circumstances? Can you, when you're going through a tough time, can you say, you know, I don't understand what's going on, but Lord, I still love you. Like Job, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Though he slays me, I'm going to still serve him. And though I were to die, yet will I worship him. You know, it's really, that's what Christianity really is all about. It's being able to say, I love the Lord. I, I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's not just some idea. It's not some, some mythological fantasy that I, I read in some ancient writing. No, I, I, I don't have a concept of some distant and distant God with great power. No, I have a relationship with God who loves me. Job tells us in Job 23, 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I love him and I love his word and I spend time with him in fellowship. You see, a genuine believer actually loves the Lord. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. In 1 Peter, in chapter 1, verse 8, uh, the apostle said, uh, whom you love, uh, yet you have never seen. We have a love for the Lord that comes from faith. Even though we haven't seen him, yet we love him. So the most important question that could be asked tonight is, do you know the Lord? Do you love Jesus Christ? The answer of whether you love him or not, you might find this interesting, is actually something God would want an answer for. Do you remember where in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, where Jesus was speaking to his beloved apostle, the apostle Peter, and three times he asked him one question, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? That's a very important question that the Lord Jesus Christ actually asked. Now, what if he were asking us tonight? What if he took you aside? What if it was just you and the Lord? You're in a corner somewhere, and he's actually speaking to you, and he was looking into your eyes tonight. What if Jesus Christ could and would actually do that? And he looked right into your eyes, and he said to you, do you love me? What would we say? If you're being honest, what could you really say? If he said, is there anything that's come between us, anything that has caused you to lose affection for me or become distant from me? Is there anything that has caused you to not love me? Could I hear you? What is it? Or can you look at him and say, you know what, Lord, to be honest with you, there have been seasons in my life when I've begun to wonder and to question and to think. But I can tell you honestly, you know, in spite of all that I am and, and all that I'm not, I can tell you honestly, I do love you. I do love you. I do want to serve you. And Jesus would say back, well, if you love me, keep my commandments because that demonstrates that you really do love me because talk is cheap, so keep my commandments. I love the Lord, he says. Now, why do you love the Lord? Well, he says in verse 1, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my supplications because he's inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. I love the Lord because my Lord answers prayer. God answers the prayer of his children, and his children love him because of that. Psalm 18, verse 6 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord, cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. So he says, I love the Lord because he has heard me. As a matter of fact, he says, I will call upon him as long as I live. The words call, or the word call, call upon him, I will cry out to him. It's a very strong Hebrew thought. I'll cry out to him. I will cry out to him for a lifetime. In other words, I'm making a lifelong commitment to pray. Now, what was going on that, that causes him to realize that the Lord is there inclining his ear? Well, verse 3, the pains of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. I am grateful because death and the grave were hunting me down. I was in great distress, I was in trouble, and I was in sorrow, and I cried out to God. Now, prophetically, this would remind us of what happened on the cross when Jesus prayed. The Bible tells us that Jesus prayed out to the Lord to deliver him. 
The Bible tells us when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to God, and God heard his prayer. The Bible in Hebrews 5, 7 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. I cried out to the Lord, and he heard me. I cried out to God, and he listened to me. I was in trouble. I was in sorrow. I cried out, deliver my soul. Verse 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Why do I love the Lord? I love the Lord because he delivers me. I love the Lord because he's gracious. I love the Lord because he's righteous, and I love the Lord because he's merciful. Righteous and merciful is a picture of the cross. Righteous because he judges sin. Merciful because Jesus took the sin upon himself on our behalf. And I love him for this. He is gracious to me. He is forgiving to me. And he knows that I'm weak. Psalm 103, verse 14 says he knows our frame. He remembers that we're just dust. And so I can cry out to this God who understands my frame and my weaknesses, and he shows me mercy. My daughter, Corinne, is trying to discipline her son, Josiah, my grandson. And so they were over yesterday. Josiah is 18 months old and very fascinated with electronic things like TVs. And he's discovered that this little button, if you push it, it turns the TV off. And it's really exciting to him. And you gotta picture it. Some of you mamas know what I'm talking about. Some of you dads do. And the baby walks in and there's a widescreen TV and he's saying, all of this and it's mine. And he walks up to it, and there's a, a bank of, of buttons, but he's discovered which button to push. And so he's there reaching down, and he pushes the button. Here comes Mama. Josiah, what are you doing? And here's Grandpa. Nothing. <laughs> Is he touching that TV set? I wasn't there that night. No big deal, baby doll. He's just touching the TV. But I have told him he is not to touch that. Josiah, stick your hand out. She's going to pat his hand. Man, you don't do that. You don't do that. You don't have to hit his hand. It's just a stupid TV set. You don't have to hit his hand. It doesn't bother me that he's touching it. I know his frame. He's just a little curious boy. He's just a little guy learning and inventing. But Mama wants to make him a good boy. And she says, well, if you'd have spanked me more often, maybe I'd have been better. <laughs> I'll give you one right now if you want. <laughs> I'm still your daddy. This is still my house. And I still got the stick in the backyard. <laughs> so Marie chimes in and says, baby, we did spank you. So, in other words, leave the kid alone. As I look at this baby, you know I am learning new lessons again, fresh lessons. He knows your frame. He knows your weaknesses. And he knows that when you blow it, that many times he hears your, your tears. He hears you crying in your room when you say, oh, God, be merciful to me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, strengthen me. God, I don't want to do this. I need your help. God, help me. And that's one of the reasons why I love the Lord. I can find trouble and I can find sorrow, but my God is gracious, righteous, and merciful, and he preserves me. Even when he says in verse 6 that you brought low, he still saves you, and he brings rest for your soul. Verse 8, you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I spoke, I'm greatly afflicted. I said, in my haste, all men are liars. So God has faithfully and mercifully delivered him. It's only Jesus who can change death, tears, and stumbling into a joyful walk. Only he can do that. 
And as he does transform you, as he says in verse 9, you walk before him. And when he says, I will walk before the Lord, the, the intimation is not simply just that he sees me as I live my life. The intimation is I will walk obediently before the Lord because I understand the mercy that he has shown me. When he says in verse 10, um, I believe, therefore I spoke, I'm greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. While undergoing his affliction, he began to see mankind for what it is. Mankind is unreliable, but even in the midst of all the pain, he was learning the lesson of genuine faith. The Lord is directing me. The Lord is moving in my life. So, verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take of the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Well, because God's promises are true and because God is faithful, my response really is a question, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? What can I give to the Lord for his acts of grace that he has bestowed upon me? Well, I'm going to take the cup of salvation and I'm going to pay my vows to the Lord. Psalm 76, 11 says, Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. Jonah 2, 9 reads, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So I will give to him what I have said I would give to him, and I will do so openly. Verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That word precious means glorious, costly, or valuable. In other words, the death of one of God's children is never regarded lightly. When one of his babies dies, God takes notice of it, is the point. And it's never something that he doesn't notice. If you take notes, Revelation chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 says, Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have any reason to, to fear death. We have legitimate reason to accept the reality of it with a hope for a future with him. This scripture tells us that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, that God cares about every one of us. Jesus on one occasion says, if God cares about the sparrows and not one of them hits the ground without your father's knowledge, well, doesn't he care about you? Well, obviously he does. And so the point he's making is very simple. The Lord loves us and cares for us. And again, that's a reason to love him. Verse 16, O Lord, truly I am your servant. I'm your servant, the son of your maidservant. You've loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I'm only a servant. I'm simply one of them. I have nothing to boast about. All I am is somebody who has attempted to faithfully follow you. I am nothing regal. I am nothing intellectual. I am nothing stupendous. All I am is a servant. And I was born of a servant. In reality, and this is something that really clashes with human ego, in reality, this is one of the most humble, truthful statements that could be made. Because when you got saved, when I got saved, Jesus rejoiced over the reality of it, not because we're special, but because we were lost and now we're found. Sometimes we may think that he did a little special dance for us because we're so outstanding and have so much to offer him. But in reality, of course, that's not true. The Lord Jesus Christ rejoices over us all we are are servants. Again, if you take notes, Luke chapter uh, 17, verses 7 through 10, puts it well. Jesus said, Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper. Gird yourself, serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. 
we have done what was our duty to do. Unprofitable servants. I was channel surfing this evening before I came to church. I came upon um, a channel that is uh, quote unquote a Christian channel and um, they were running an ad for the particular channel and they said something like this particular channel contains all of your Christian stars, your Christian stars. And then it shows a picture of a particularly well-known uh, evangelist and all. And I turned to my wife, Marie, and I said, isn't that interesting that, that people are being taught to worship celebrity even in the church, to look at servants as being higher than what they really are? Listen, guys, that's a sickness in the church that's bringing it down. The raising of man to some kind of status that is beyond where he's supposed to or she's supposed to be. Paul said it very well when he said, all we are is servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. Sometimes when a church grows and you have lots of people showing up, people will come and they'll, they'll actually want to know what the secret of your success is. How do you get so many people to come there? I learned a long time ago, if you lift Jesus up, people will come to him. That's all it is. It's, it's, a, it's a great God. If we get away and get out of the way, you will see people come to Christ. But we, we, when we get in the way, well, people may come to our persuasion or our faith, but they're not really coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. A great preacher of another time was walking down the street where a man who was drunk approached him and walked up to him, and he said to this great preacher, hi, he says, you don't know me. And the guy's drunk. He says, you don't know me, but I'm one of your converts. And the great preacher looking at him said, I have no doubt in my mind that you are one of my converts, for had you been a convert to Jesus Christ, you would not be drunk right now. And that's the truth. When you come to Christ, he changes your life. When you come to church, it may not have an effect on you at all. And so what are we? We are only servants. And we're grateful because, as he says in verse 16, you have loosed my bonds. As a result, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. My worship will be obvious. I openly will reveal my love for the Lord. I give my offering in the temple as it is commanded. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not doing it to be seen, but I'm only obeying the Lord as I do so. And the bottom line is genuine worship is always noticed and honor will always go to the Lord as a result of that. And finally, Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Laud him, all ye peoples. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. When's the last time you said laud him? You know, you usually put some laud in some beans. No, that's lard. The word laud <laughs> means to praise. When it says, oh, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, it simply means praise him, all you people. Well, I want you to see something here because you might not notice this. As a matter of fact, I'm certain none of us would if it weren't pointed out to us. It was pointed out to me, and I want to point it out to you. Here in the middle of the Bible, a Bible that is written to the Jewish people, you have a call to Gentiles to worship. You have a call to the Gentiles in this book that is written specifically to the people of God, especially to the Jewish nation, in the time of its writing. And yet the command is actually prophetic because it's pointing to a time when Gentile and Jew together will worship the Lord. That time comes when somebody has a saving knowledge of God through the Savior, Jesus Christ, because we become one in the Lord. You see, humanity today is divided into various segments, and we like to break it down into multiple ethnicities. So we speak concerning the, uh, the uh, Asian, or we speak concerning the, the African, or we speak concerning the Caucasian. We can speak concerning a multiplicity of ethnicities, and we break it down into a variety and all. And we speak of the human race in division. In the Bible, actually, in the Old Testament, mankind is divided into two segments. You may or may not know this. Mankind is divided in the Old Testament into two segments, Jew and Gentile. 
When you go through the Old Testament, you will see that it's either Jew or it is Gentile. But when you get into the New Testament, mankind is divided into three, Jew, Gentile, and the Church of God. And the Church of God is made up of believing Jew and believing Gentile, and that barrier of separation has been lost because of Christ. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, when he says, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Jew, Gentile, church of God. And so we belong to one another, whether we're Messianic believers, whether we're African American, whether we're Hispanic, whether we're Asian, whatever it is that we may identify with, Native American, you name it. When you're born again, you are one in Jesus Christ. And therefore, he calls us to worship. And so he's crying out. He says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud and praise him, all you people. Why? Well, his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Why should I praise him? Because God's word is truth. And we can trust his merciful kindness forever. And it is great towards us. How great is it? His merciful kindness is demonstrated in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. I've had people in the past, one friend in particular comes to mind, who think that somehow they have to better themselves in order to come to the Lord. My friend Nick and I were having a conversation, and he's a very old friend of mine. I'd known him since I was a little boy. And I finally, as a friend will say to another friend, asked him one day, Nikki, when are you going to give your heart to Jesus Christ? And Nikki looks at me, my friend, I'd known since I was nine or ten years old, looks at me. He says, well, I plan on doing that someday, Dave. And I said, really? When? He says, when I clean my act up a little bit more. I said, I didn't realize you're an idol idolater. He says, idolater? What are you talking about? I said, Nick, you're an idolater. I said, you're trying to make yourself presentable to God, and you don't understand that you can't. You need to understand that you come to God the way that you are, and God makes you different. You come to the Lord asking for grace and mercy. You repent from your sin because you hate it because of what is done in your life, but you also come to God saying, God, be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. And when you come to him, you come on his terms. You don't come on your own. See, those who want to clean up their act and come to the Lord are never going to be good enough. Even if you could be the most perfect person on the face of the earth for the rest of your life, you still have a history of sin up to that point, and you're going to sin anyway, no matter how hard you try. That's why we need a Savior. And so we bless the Lord and praise the Lord because His Word is true. And God has said in His Word that He would forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has said in his word that if any of us come to him, that we will become new creations. All things are passed away. Behold, he said, all things are become new. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Jesus in Mark 13, 31 said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And that's why we know the truth of the Lord endures forever, and that's why we can praise the Lord because he has saved us by his mercy, his kindness, and his truth. So, I guess the question goes back very simply as we close. As I began this message, the psalmist said, I love the Lord. Can you say the same thing tonight? Can you say the same thing? Can you say in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, just you and him, looking into his eyes, can you say that? Can you say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love you. If you can't, you need to get right with the Lord. You're backsliding. If you can't, it may be that you're not even saved. How can you love the one you don't even know? So the invitation would be to you. God extends his mercy, and God extends his forgiveness. But you have to ask for it.
you have to come to him and say, God, be merciful to me. I need you. Help me. I want to praise you. I want to trust you. I want to walk with you. So God, forgive me a sinner. Come into my life. If you can do that, then you can be born again.